Hi guys, welcome back to Rewild, where we talk about environmental psychology and other interesting things. Um, so today's topic, I wanted to touch on the meaning of transpersonal psychology, how you can become a transpersonal psychologist, and the significance of that for the modern psychology community. Transpersonal psychology uh, was touched upon by an individual called Abraham Maslow. You might know him from Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, which is a really interesting, cool um, system of looking at people's finding their ultimate potential. Um, Maslow is one of my favorite uh, psychology and social science individuals, and he talked about something called a fourth force in psychology in order to separate it from more traditional types. Transpersonal psychology or spiritual psychology is a subfield or school of psychology that seeks to integrate the spiritual and transcendent aspects of the human experience. So what that means to someone like myself, who is a green psychologist or an echo psychologist, is understanding kind of the all in the small. I also think today to touch on the importance of transpersonal psychology is also to look at how community and systems thinking interplays with research methodology methodology in um, the humanities. So Maslow, as well as uh, Groff, was another that was one of the original people who sort of proposed that we should have a psychology that is more social, that is more collective. And that kind of goes beyond what we typically think of when we think about Freudian psychology and people just sort of like laying on the couch talking about their childhood. What I think is most important to grasp from transpersonal psychology as well as environmental and social psychologies is the idea that we're not just looking at the individual, we're also looking at the systems that surround that individual and how environment and social customs, family history, your culture might play in. I think we think of this also in a spiritual sense because I think a lot of people associate spirituality with collective consciousness and sort of like a totality of consciousness. So if you're interested in the idea of consciousness and then you're thinking about collective consciousness as the totality, then we're sort of getting into the realm of spirituality, whether or not you're agnostic or atheistic. Um, that might be a more material explanation for what we mean when we're talking about spiritual psychology. For those of you who are a little bit more woo, um, it is kind of neat, I think, to be able to validate some spiritual beliefs or at least uh, take them seriously enough to study them in the future rather than just sort of writing them off on the outset. One thing that to me is the most important about transpersonal psychology, green psychology, echo psychology, and uh, research that is less objective and objectifying is that I think it can increase the accuracy of our ability to be honest about the way we see the world. So for example, um, I once had a path of possibly going into neuroscience, but I chose not to because I learned that for a majority of students researching neuroscience, it was required of them to kill lots and lots of mice and rats. And I found this um, a little bit difficult and kind of disconcerting. Psychology is about, typically in my understanding, improving our mental health. And around that time that I made the decision not to go into the particular field of biopsychology or neuroscience, I was reading in forums about students and researchers who were having um, trauma and PTSD-like effects from having to do their research, which required an excessive amount of what you might consider to be animal abuse. So on one level, if we're going with the purely quantifiable stem lord kind of research idea of science, yeah, maybe this is necessary for us to gain that knowledge. But from a more spiritual or social science kind of perspective, looking at systems theory, looking at epistemology, we might ask ourselves, is there really so much we need to learn about the mind that it would hurt the natural world that we exist in? that you know, it requires a lot of animal abuse in order to get that knowledge? Is it worth 
that if the students doing that research are experiencing psychological harm. Other examples of where holistic transpersonal uh, mindfulness or considerations for our research can benefit the scientific community is understanding that we all have bias. I think a lot of times we forget that when we talk about the scientific method and we talk about removing ourselves from the subject that we're studying. Some of the most famous examples of this you see in archaeology and anthropology, where anthropologists in the back in the day when anthropology was first kind of becoming a study um, was considered very racist. A lot of people were unable to do the work of anthropology in a culturally sensitive way because they were looking at other people through the lens of their own culture rather than being able to be objective. I think anthropology is one of the best um, sciences, disciplines that shows us a historical precedence for the idea of questioning objectivity in research methodolog methodologies. We are not really that objective. And as much as we might try um, using double blind studies or trying to make sure that our methods are controlling for researcher bias, at the end of the day, research bias can still kind of impact things. So one of the things that I deeply, deeply love about transpersonal and eco psychology is that we allow for the existence of the observer to be in relationship to some extent with the observed, to at least acknowledge that. When I think about um, strange things like spooky action at a distance with respect to um, physics phenomena, I think it's really plausible to consider that observing phenomena by the very nature of us having consciousness and looking at a phenomena we may be altering its reality in a certain kind of way, potentially, or a researcher might accidentally throw results in a social science study because of the way they treat their subjects, because of their own preconceptions about their subject matter. So allowing yourself to understand that you are only human, you are also an organism, and you are also in relationship and part of a system of relationship in the ecology of where you live and uh, the other organisms within and around you. I think this can make you sometimes a more objective researcher by nature of not neglecting to understand that you yourself are an organism. And that in a certain sense, when we are studying the world around us, we are also studying ourselves. Um, I think that's all about all I'm gonna say, just for a short introduction video on this uh, concept. Overall, I think that there is a lack of validating research that respects spirituality and that can embrace the idea of collectivism uh, in practice in the scientific method. I think that we sometimes might be benefited also in the scientific community by understanding that the scientific method was founded in a particularly kind of Western and ethno-Eurocentric sort of way where um, animals and mankind are kind of seen in a hierarchy. And um, it's good for us to allow that to kind of be questioned as we move forward in the future. I think this is especially true for organisms, women and people of color that have been studied by typically um, white male Western researchers in the research methodology that has been uplifted by that culture and by that epistemology and worldview. So when we give ourselves that chance to go back to the way other cultures or other ancestors observed nature as if their harmonic relationship with nature was relevant to the equation might benefit us even with respect to honoring objectivity when we are researching things or taking down data points or creating our research methods for what we want to learn about the world. I think that it can be dangerous to remove objectivity from the equation, but I think that it can also ensure that we are honest about how objective we can reasonably be, especially in social science research and even to some extent in our research of biology and ecology. We ourselves are organisms, and yet 
a lot of people don't even consider human beings animals. I think that's kind of odd. <laughs> human beings are definitely animals, but you see the epistemology sometimes of ideologies like Christianity will sort of trickle down into our worldview when we look at who is a researcher and who is a subject, who is the observer and who is the observed. By breaking all of that down, I think we can help open the sciences to more diversity, to empowering people who have typically be, been disempowered by being objectified as the observed and the researched, allowing more equality between those who get to play those roles and being more flexible in how we define those roles in our relationship with each other and with the wider world. I hope that this gives you a little taste of what it means to be a transpersonal psychologist, what it means to honor not only the individual psyche, but to look at our psyche as it pertains to the collective whole. I think that's really, really important for getting a complete picture of the juicy reality that is psychology. And one last thought that I'll give you, the original word psychology comes from the study of the soul. A lot of times we don't really think of that. We think more about things like neuroscience where we're studying exactly what parts of the brain do what. And that's actually a very recent study that's only been around for about 30 years or so. But I think that we can do a lot better by um, understanding these old histories of psychology, literally meaning psyche, the soul, and in Western thinking, the brain sitting in the soul right there. Um, and being pertaining to that. I think there are other religions like um, in Hinduism that talk a little bit about like the importance of certain organs and the mind and the brain with respect to our spiritual capacity. And these are interesting concepts to kind of play with as we go forward in understanding how we want to do interdisciplinary study and how we want to define various forms of study and research. Um, one final other thing that I might leave you with to kind of stew on is the idea of psychology being the study of the seat of the soul and how that kind of encompasses transpersonal psychology. And in a funny kind of way, I think we've forgotten that a little bit. Jungian psychology kind of touches on this as well, where Jung talked about global archetypes as they pertain to the individual. And Jung actually got into a big fight with Freud, for those of you who know all that um, ancient history. But in ancient, ancient times, before psychology was even invented as a typical like Western research study, um, I think the earliest psychologists might have been considered people like da Vinci, people who did astronomy, astrology, um, and other forms of things that we might not necessarily consider as scientific today, like alchemy. However, these were the origins of modern science, things like chemistry, things like physics. And even farther back in the day, there is a case to be made that the original psychologists, the original pharmacologists were herbalists and people who would have been considered spiritual practitioners in ancient society. So that's one of my favorite parts about the history of psychology and this history of the sciences in general, that a long time ago, everything was very, very interdisciplinary. And today, these uh, studies have been split up a little bit, but there's a really good case to be made for trying to converge them again in order to deepen our understanding of the world. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Rewild. Um, I think next week I'm going to be talking a little bit about various ways to get healthy. Um, I'm going to title that Get Healthy With Me because I'm kind of on a health kick myself. And I'd like to share some of the things I've learned on this station to help you improve your mental and physical well-being. Um, check out Transpersonal Psychology if this interested you. All right, we'll see you next week. Remember to like, share, and subscribe if this helped you out. And we'll see you next time. Bye.